Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma infa'na bima alimtana wa alimna ma yanfa'una. Allahumma zidna ilman innaka anta alimul hakeem. Allahumma jal hadihi al-muhadara hujjatan lana. La hujjatan alina ya rabbil alameen. Amma ba'd. This is the last class that we'll be having. Uh, the purpose of knowledge. Uh, the next class will be another class similar to this, uh, but not this book. When we last uh, spoke about this, he said, Al-amal bil-ilm ablaq wa fil dawa Acting according to the knowledge that you have is more, uh, is stronger in terms of giving dawa. It's stronger in terms of giving dawa. And so the Shaykh, Hafidullah, he mentioned about praying Salat al-Fajr. And he said, However, we live in a time period now. Now listen to the way the Shaykh explains this. He says, we're living in a time period now. Meaning that we find people that they're up all night. We live in a time period where people are up all night. Uh, we live in a time period where people are up all night. And how many people miss Salat al-Fajr? Especially now, and this is an uh, encouragement for the Muslims, is that right now we're in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. And we know that the reward, fasting, and doing good deeds during this time is tremendous. Uh, something that we should all take advantage of. And from those things, is that if we fall short in making Salat al-Fajr in the Masjid, uh, perhaps we make du'a, we make du'a that Allah will make it easy for you and for us to get up and to pray Salat al-Fajr in the masjid for the men. And there are many people that are negligent as it relates to Salat al-Fajr. So here the Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him and preserve him. He said that maybe people are up at night going over manaqashat and miya meaning maybe they're up at night going over islamic academic issues so for example you have people that study islam and they're reading all night trying to get closer to allah this is the person he's talking about so he says he said what about the one who stays up at the night um, studying, reading about the Quran, going through tafsir, studying hadith, studying things that are going to get, a, get them closer to Allah, but they sleep and they miss Salat al-Fajr. He said, Even if they were up all night memorizing the Quran, or reading the Quran, if a person stayed up this late, late at night, reading Qur'an, memorizing Qur'an, if it's to the effect that it will cause you to miss Salat al-Fajr, then it is haram for that person to stay up. This is for a person that is up all night in worship. What about the one that's not up all night in worship? What about the one that's up all night watching movies, social media, doing other things that may not, you may not get any reward at all in it, and you're up all night and you miss Salat al-Fajr. And that person is sinful in leaving off uh, Salat al-Fajr in that case. And he said, salat al If you have this man, and most of the, out of all the five salawat, the one that is missed or most negligent, the most kemajafil uh, hadith, as we find in the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, and he said, "And the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, 'Afdalu salawati and Allahi salat al-subh.' He said, 'The best salat with Allah is salat al-subh. Salat al-subh is salat al-fajr. Yom al-Jum'a fi jama'a.' He said, 'The best salat is salat al-fajr on Yom al-Jum'a in congregation. The best salat is salat al-fajr on Yom al-Jum'a." in congregation and he said that this is the salat that a lot of people leave off now 
and understand that they're speaking from the aspect of being in a Muslim society. We're in, in this society, you find people, most people, or a lot of people, they pray, but a lot of people pray in, in the masjid for Fajr. Uh, and then he also meant, and a lot of people don't. And he also mentions, he says how on Yom al Jum'ah, as we know on Yom al Jum'ah for Salat al Fajr, uh, the Sunnah is to recite Surah to Sajda, Surah to Sajda for Salat al Fajr, and uh, Surah to the Insan, right? These two Surah, Surah Tan, these are the, the Surah that are read generally on Yom al Jum'ah for Fajr. So he said that you find that people will. Because sort of the sajda is kind of long. So he said people, and this is in the land of the Muslims, you can hear people praying. So they say they may wait before they come to the masjid until they almost finish uh, the first rakah and then they'll join in late. They'll join in late just so they catch the end of sort of the sajda and then they will join in late for salat al fajr. He said also it's important to get a good night's sleep. And all of this is the purpose of any so that when you get up for salat al fajr, you can have turkeys. You can be mindful of what's going on in the salah. And you can be mindful of your worship of Allah Jalla wa'ala. The next part of Shaykh Rahimullah, or Shaykh, may Allah preserve him, he says, Su'alallahi al-i'ana ala al-amal bil That we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid us in acting on whatever knowledge that we have. To aid us in acting on whatever knowledge that we have. We find that the Prophet Ali والسلام, he mentioned a serious dua that was reported by Um Salama. Um Salama anha, she said that the Prophet Ali والسلام, would always make this dua. That the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would always make this dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan this is a tremendous, tremendous dua that we should uh, become accustomed to making. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allahumma, O oh Allah, inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an. O oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge. Wa rizman tayyiban, and a halal, healthy income. Wa amalan mutaqabbalan and actions that are accepted, actions that Allah will accept. This is the dua that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make. He was the Prophet. He was the best of all of us and he would make this dua. You are the He will die. He will always make this dua. And it says, he will not ask for four things, but rather he will make dua for these three things. Ilm al that beneficial knowledge, righteous or actions being accepted in a halal earning. He says, well, he had them in a munasib, and he said the Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him, preserve him. He said it is more suitable for a person to make this dua after Salat al Fajr. Why after Salat al Fajr? Anyone know? What's the benefit of starting with this dua after Salat al Fajr? Anyone? What's the benefit in making this dua after Salat al Fajr or while you're in Salat al Fajr? What's the benefit? No opinions? You have an opinion? It's okay. Huh? You don't know? What do you think the wisdom is? We think the wisdom of making this dua during Salat al Fajr. Huh? Huh? The question? What's the benefit of making this dua? Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi. Oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge. Wa rizqan tayyiban. And halal earnings. Wa amalan mutaqabdalan. And actions that are accepted. What's the benefit of making this dua around Salat al Fajr? You get ready to start your day. You get ready to start your day, right? And so, if you get ready to start your day, this will be a nice dua to set you off, to set you straight for the day, to get you where you need to be. It says, "As uh, so, the Shaykh Rahim Allah or Habib Allah says, 'Sabda yomukabada into Sunday Fajr bihadhi dua.' So you start your day off 
after reciting this dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan mutaqabbalan thumma tantalak fi yawmika wa qad ista'anta billah wa talabta wa awnahu Then after that a person will start his day. After making this dua, a person will start his or her day knowing that they made this dua in hopes of getting closer to Allah Jalla wa ala and seeking knowledge getting a halal earning during that day and praying that your actions will be accepted during that time. Now, having knowledge in Islam, having knowledge in Islam is not just the benefit that a person knows something because we have a lot of brothers and sisters that have information and have knowledge. However, some of us don't act on it. Some of us do not act on the knowledge that we have. And this is where the problem comes in for that person. Uh, as we find from the Salaf, that the Salaf, or the scholars of the past, they will look down on the one that did not act on the knowledge that they had. They will look down on the one that did not act on the knowledge that they had. And the Salaf, rahimahumullah ta'ala, وَرَدَّ عَنْهُمْ نَقُولٌ كَثِيرًا جِدًّا فِي ذَمَّ مَنْ لَا يَشْتَغْلُ بِالْعَمَلِ There are many narrations and reports of the scholars of the past vilifying a person if they did not act on the knowledge that they had. And so we say, as it mentions here, كُولَ أَبِي هُرَيْرَ تَرَارِ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ And where he said, مِثْلُ عِلْمٍ لَا يُعْمَلُ بِهِ كَمِثْلِ كَنْزٍ لَا يُنْفَقُ مِنْهُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَّلِ So we have a statement of Abu Huraira رَضِي اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ And he said, مِثْلُ عِلْمٍ If a person has knowledge, وَلَا يُعْمَلُ بِهِ But they didn't act on the knowledge that they have. It's like a person that has treasures and jewels and they do not spend from that treasure or their wealth in the sake of Allah or for the sake of Allah. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, su'ila an rajulan yaktubu ahadith fa yukfa. Imam Ahmed was asked about a man who writes a lot of hadith. Imam Ahmed was asked about a man who writes a lot of hadith. Qala yambagi an yukfaru amala bihi ala qadr ziyadatahi fi al-talam. Imam Ahmed said, a person that studies hadith that is important or imperative that whatever information he gets that he increases in his talab. So for example, whatever hadith, whatever he learned that he needs to increase, his actions need to add up to the knowledge that he used to achieve or seek after. ثُمَّ قَالَ سُبْلَ الْعِلْمِ لَسُبْلَ الْمَا He said that pathway to knowledge is similar to the pathway a person takes when they want to achieve wealth. He says إِنَّ الْمَالَ إِذَا ازْدَادَ ازْدَادَ زَكَاتُهُ and he said, for example, if a person's wealth increases, then they must pay zakat on that wealth. Likewise, if a person's knowledge increases, they have to pay zakat on the knowledge that they have. Qala al-Khatib, Khatib al-Baghdadi rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, كَمَا لَا تَنْفَعُ الْأَمْوَالُ إِلَّا بِإِنْفَاقِهَا كَذَارِكَ لَا تَنْفَعُ الْعُلُومُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا Al-Khatib, Al-Baghdadi rahimahullah He said He said that money does not benefit a person unless he spends it Likewise, knowledge will not benefit a person unless he acts on it In other words a person can have a lot of money but if they don't spend the money may in fact it didn't benefit them. Likewise, a person has a lot of a lot of knowledge, but if they don't act on it, may in fact is no is no benefit. So this issue here of having knowledge and acting on it is a serious serious issue as it relates to Muslims. Many of us uh, may have some form of knowledge, but if we don't act on it, it will not aid us. قال الحسن البصري رحمه الله He said أنزل القرآن ليعمل به He said the Quran was revealed so that we can act on it 
And then he said, فَاتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ تِلَاوَتَهُ عَمَلًا So people would take recitation of the Qur'an as their action. Meaning they would act on it. وَذَقْرِ بْنُ جَوْزِي رَحِمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي تَلْبِيسِ إِبْلِيسِ Ibn al-Jawzi, he has a book called The Deceptions of Shaytan. The Deceptions of Shaytan. وَقَالَ يَعْنِي أَنَّهُمْ اِقْتَصَرُوا عَلَى التِّلَاوَةِ He said, he mentioned there's a group of them, اِقْتَصَرُوا عَلَى التِّلَاوَةِ A group of them, they would limit themselves to just the recitation of the Qur'an. وَتَرَكُوا الْعَمَلَ بِي And then they would leave off acting on the Qur'an. So, we find nowadays there are many people that memorize the book of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Many people to have the Qur'an memorized. As many of the ulama will mention, Al-Qur'an yakun hujjatan lak o alik. Meaning the Qur'an will be a proof for you or a proof against you. And he said nowadays that, and this is during the time of Ibn al-Jawzi, who, if I'm not mistaken, he died in the 8th century. Right? Ibn al-Jawzi, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he said, يعني أنهم اقتصروا على التلاوة that people would just suffice them with just the recitation of the Qur'an وَتَلَكُوا الْعَمَلَ بِهِ and leave off acting in accordance to the Qur'an وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ لِإِبْرَهِيمِ إِبْنِ أَدْهَمْ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ So Allah says a رَجُلٌ لِإِبْرَهِيمِ He says to Ibrahim a man says to Ibrahim he said, Allah says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Allah says, call on me and I will answer your call. Call on me and I will answer your call. So he said, Fama baluna nadanu, Fama baluna. Shit. Shit. So he says, Fama baluna. فَمَا بَعْلُنَا نَدْعُوا فَلَا يُسْتَجَابْ لَنَا He said, how is it for us that we make dua but Allah will not answer our dua? In other words, why is it that Allah will not answer our dua? Allah says what? Call on me and I will answer your dua. We make dua but Allah is not answering our dua. Why is that? This is the question that he said. فَقَالَ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمِ So Ibrahim said to him, Zakat al so Ibrahim said to him, وَمَنْ أَجْلِ خَمْسَةِ أَشَّاءِ He said the reason is for five things. There are five things why your dua is not being answered. قَالَ وَمَا هِيَ He said, but what is it? What are these five things that are causing my dua not to be answered? He says, قَالَ أَرَفْتُمَ اللَّهِ فَلَمْ تُؤَدُّ حَقَّهُ That you know Allah, you have knowledge of Allah, like many of us, you may have knowledge of Allah, who Allah is, but we don't give what you don't give Allah his rights. You know Allah, but don't give Allah his rights. That's number one. Number two, he said, وَقَرَأْتُمْ قُرْآنَ فَلَمْ تَعْمَلُوا بِمَا فِيهِ He said, you read the Qur'an, you recited the Qur'an, but you don't act on what you find in it. وَقُلْتُمْ And then he said, نُحِبُّ الرَّسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَتَرَقْتُمْ سُنَّتَهُ You love the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, but you left off his sunnah. And then he said, وَقُلْتُمْ نَلْعَنُوا إِبْلِيسَ وَأَطْعَمْتُمُوهُ He said, we curse the shaytan, but we feed him. We curse the shaytan, but we feed him. And then he says, وَخَامِسَ And the fifth thing, تَرَقْتُمْ عُيُوبَكُمْ وَأَقَدْتُمْ بِعُيُوبِ النَّاسِ And we left off our own deficiencies and started pointing out the deficiencies of others. These are from the reasons, from the five reasons why a person's dua may not be answered. As it relates to us in the time that we live in, especially a lot of these things, but especially the last thing, we forget our own shortcomings and focus on everyone else's. Uh, one of the reasons that people do this in general is that if we tear somebody else apart, this is a way to build our own selves up. Huh? Perhaps the person that tears someone else down, they have deficiencies. But they don't want anyone to focus on their deficiencies, so they choose to focus on everyone else's. Huh? If I focus on someone else's shortcomings and deficiencies, 
Then they will elevate myself and they will keep people from focusing on mine. Um, this is a strategy that has been used for many. This is some this is stuff that people do. But call us Sufyan Thori Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He said, May Allah have mercy on, on Abu Hazm. He said, Qala Rabi and Naswal Yom Bil in Watalakul Amal. He said, Today we find people that are happy with knowledge, but they leave off action. Qala Malik ibn Dinar. Malik ibn Dinar, he said, In al Abda ida talab al in al Amidi Kasarahu al Muhu. He said that if we find a person seeking knowledge for the purpose of, of acting in accordance to it, it will break him. Meaning he's going to be working hard. His knowledge will hold him down or will break him. He said, now, if a person were to seek knowledge, if a person were to seek knowledge for other than that, other than working or acting on that knowledge, he says, is that the for then that person, now pay attention to this. If a person seeks knowledge, and this is for everybody to see. If a person seeks knowledge, a person that seeks knowledge, if they act on their knowledge, their knowledge will hold them down, it will break them. You know, they will work hard and diligent with it. It said, but if a person were to seek knowledge for other than acting on that knowledge, then you will find an increase in fujur and in sin and transgression from those people. And you'll also see extreme arrogance from those people. Extreme arrogance an extreme fajur, yani ma'asi, fawahish, lewdness, fornication to the end of it. You'll find that these people, this is what they would do. وَقَالَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ مُعْتَزِ He says, عِلْمٌ بِلَا عَمَلٍ كَالشَّجَرَ بِلَا ثَمَرَ He said, knowledge with no action is like a tree that doesn't bear any fruit. Brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, this issue of knowledge is a, is a serious, serious affair, and it's one in which uh, we shall all be mindful of and fear, and fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we, meaning we, all of us, if Allah bestowed upon us a certain level of information and knowledge, and we deceive the people with it. Be mindful. Brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, if Allah Jalla gives you some form of Islamic knowledge and education, that you are honest with it. You convey the amana, it's a trust. And that knowledge is not used to deceive people and to control people. It's not used to deceive people and control people. And it says, وَقَالَ عَيْضَ عِلْمُ الْمَنَافِقْ فِي كَوْلِهِ So Abdullah ibn Mu'taz he said, the knowledge of the hypocrite is only in his statements. But the knowledge of the believer is in his actions. And then he says, He said, If Allah wants for a slave good, Now listen to this. This is a, a tremendous statement from one of the salaf. That's one that we should think about and ponder over. He said, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا If Allah Jalla wa'ala, He wanted goodness for one of His slaves, فَتَحَ لَهُ بَابِ الْخَيْرٍ That Allah is called بَابِ الْعَمَلٍ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make it easy for that person to do righteous actions. In order to do righteous actions, brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, هُوَ يَحْتَاجِ لِلْتَوْفِيقِ That you need tawfiq. You need uh, Allah's aid to be able to do righteous actions. And he says, وَأَغْلَقَ عَنْهُ بَابَ الْجَدْلِ And then Allah will close for that person the door of argumentation. وَإِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ شَرًّا If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for a slave evil, فَتَحَ لَهُ بَابَ الْجَدْلِ That he will open up the door for argumentation for him. وَأَغْلَقَ عَنْهُ بَابَ الْعَمَلِ And he will close the door for actions for that person. It's a heavy statement. وَسَمِيَ الْحَسَنْ قَوْمًا يَتَجَادَلُونَ Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah He will listen to a group of people argue back and forth. فَقَالَ هَا أُولَاءِ قَوْمُ مَلُّ الْعِبَادَةِ He said those people, 
they're busy, they're not, they're not doing a lot of worship. Those people that are busy arguing about issues that have no benefit, they're not busy with worship. They can't be. Mellul ibadah. That they're weak in their worship. Wa khaf alayhim al qawm. And the statements, the statements don't mean anything. Wa qalla war'ahum fatakallamu. And these people have a small amount of piety. They have a small amount of piety. The people that are busy with things like that. Wa qala bashar ibn harith. Al ilmu hasan. Liman amila bi. Wa man lam yamu ma adarru. He said, knowledge is good for the one who acts on it. Then the one that doesn't act on, their, on that person's knowledge, it will harm him in a bad way. It will put that person in a bad way. Brothers and sisters in our Islam, uh, we're going to finish uh, this book, inshallah ta'ala, and there's going to be another one uh, that comes after this, inshallah. Uh, Brother Saeed will be teaching it. Um, there's a few statements that I wanted to read from uh, Al Khatib Al Baghdadi. He said, "Yani in lam yanfa'ahu bi an yamal bihi darru bi kauni hujjatan alayhi." That if a person doesn't act on the knowledge that they have, then that knowledge will harm him, and it will be a proof against him. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I know today's class is a little shorter, but before we conclude, this is a reminder uh, to the ones whoever. Uh, get on the microphone to teach and give lessons and talk to people about Islam. Whatever comes out of your mouth, you own it before you speak it. And after you talk, the speech you says, it owns you. And tell people, pay attention. You get on the microphone and you start teaching Islam. This is all of us. Before you open your mouth, you own what you say. As soon as it comes out of your mouth, that speech owns you. They will forever own you. So this is advice to myself and the brothers and sisters here and other places that may be watching. Uh, and a lot of issues that we talk about here are very specific to our community, our city. So perhaps people may listen into the classes and may not be able to uh, relate or really understand what goes on in certain uh, cities, etc., as it relates to the Muslims. Um, however, if you find yourself speaking ill of Muslims and you don't know, really know what you're talking about, remember you have to ask yourself this before you open your mouth. Are you willing to stand in front of Allah for what comes out of your mouth? If you want to speak bad about another Muslim brother or sister, are you willing to wear that on the day of judgment? Are you willing to wear that on the day of judgment? This is a question that everyone has to ask themselves. Um, however, as I mentioned last week uh, and before, I stand on what I say that whoever teaches Islam needs to have a resume, period, period, period. No matter who you are, where you come from, it doesn't matter. Everyone should have a resume and you can only get this off in our communities. You can't go to any other type of community and present yourself to teach Islam without having a resume. They will laugh at you and tell you to get out of here. But in our communities, because a lot of times we're not educated as a people in general, not everybody, but in general, we're not that educated. So therefore, anybody who looks nice, speaks well, they come into our community and they tell us what's right, what's wrong, and we accept it. No one dares to ask what they study. No one dares to ask, let me see your resume, Ahi, in a respectful way. In a respectful, you don't want to be disrespectful, but at the end of the day, this is your right. This is your right. And if I were to not say this, I would be negligent not telling you to do that. So I stand on that. Anybody who gets on the minbar or the microphone and starts talking about Islam, they got to be ready to open the books up. Where did you stay? What information do you have? Huh? I know you made Umrah a couple times and called a couple scholars, but what do you have under your belt? It's a realistic question. Sometimes we look at people because they come from different countries, we think they're better than us. Real talk. A person comes from the UK, we think they're better than us. It's not true. They may speak better than you because that's, that's what they brought up on, but that doesn't mean they're sharper than you. You have to ask questions. You have to ask questions. 
Don't be a fool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, for that ta'kilun, do you not use your intellect. Every last one of us, Allah bless every last one of us with a brain. Use it. Exercise it. Make it work. And it doesn't mean a brother may come from another country and they may be knowledgeable. They may have credentials. They may know exactly what they're talking about. Alhamdulillah. Or they may not know what they're talking about. Or they may not. The reality of it is this. When a person studies Islam, you open up the book. Huh? Meaning, whatever you say out your mouth, you own it. But once it comes out your mouth, it owns you. Once it comes out your mouth, it owns you. Understand something else, brothers and sisters in Islam. Our religion is perfect. We're the ones, we have holes with us, but Islam doesn't have any holes. Is that clear? You can find mistakes with me because I'm Bashar, I'm human. You can find errors in classes, you may find a mistake in the translation, I made it pronounce something wrong. This what? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It doesn't diminish someone. It's just the human side of things. But it's another thing to make a mistake, and it's another thing to not have no resume at all. No resume. No verifiable resume of what you study. None. Yet you come into a minority community and control the people. How is that possible? This cannot be done anywhere else. No other community can you come in there with no resume and control the whole people. This is impossible. Only in the inner cities. At any event, we're gonna stop with that, inshallah. Anyone have any questions? We'll open up the floor, inshallah. only in our communities. I mean, you can't, for example, we have like, you have like, uh, what's the next shit here? Masjid Al-Aqsa. You can't go and teach there, you don't have no resume. You can't go to the other non-urban American communities and start talking about Islam with no resume. Right. Go ahead. I'm gonna tell you what Sheikh Salah Luke Haydan told her brothers 10 years ago. No scholar overseas has any jurisdiction in America, period. No scholar overseas have any jurisdiction in America. They don't even have jurisdiction in their own country. How are you gonna have jurisdiction in America? No scholar, and this is a statement of Sheikh Salah Luke Haydan. And he's one of the, he was one of the top judges in Saudi Arabia for many years. There's no scholar in Saudi Arabia or any other place that has jurisdiction in America. Period. Advice? No doubt. Take advice. Huh? But you live here. You see what's going on. We can't be sheep anymore. You have to use your intellect, Ya Khwan. It's okay to ask questions. If you don't understand, it's okay to say, Sheikh, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Make it make sense to me. I don't get it. You can do that with anything else in your life. Let you get locked up. You're going to try to convince everybody. Oh, no, that's not me. You're going to come with a case. You're going to try to defend yourself here. You just take it. The Sheikh said it. That's what it is. No. The Sheikh is not the Prophet. It's not the Islam. It's not the Quran. Now, what they say of his back, Baki Tab, Sun, Nuk, Bella, you accept it. But they're Bashar. They're human. They're going to make mistakes just like you would. And you're allowed to ask questions. You're allowed to ask questions. If you don't understand, you're allowed to say, I don't get it. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Make it make sense to me. If it's right what you're saying, I want to follow, just make it make sense. It doesn't make sense. The problem with Quran is that we've been made afraid to ask questions. If you don't ask questions, how will you learn if you don't ask questions? Huh? So the issue was, can the brothers be made to sit down? Who's going to, I mean, it, it, Sure, everybody should, everybody should fear a law, man, know your level. Fear a law, know your level. You know that you haven't studied certain issues. Listen, how many years, a brother told me the other day, he said, listen, you brothers, y'all don't warn against Ahlul Bidah. Other brothers, they warn against Ahlul Bidah throughout the whole city. I said, 
What people from Alpha Beta they want against? And this city. You know the you know the people Alpha Beta they want against? People that study with them overseas. Their classmates. Brothers that sat with the same scholars they sat with. Brothers that look study the same books, teach the same books, they they the ones that everybody know their names and their misogyny. Yeah, who's the Evan by 45th and um Rona? What's his name? Who's the man more broad in Glenwood? What's his, what's his name again? Oh, you don't know his name. You know my name, though. They all know my name. They know his name. They know Tarrier's name. But you don't know the people who you believe to be out of bit. You don't know their names. So what is, what's, what's the real problem? Like, what's really going on? What's really going on? Is it really about out of Or is it really about we gotta get these bulls out the way? What is it? Nah. Fuck you shit. Read from Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. Do that make sense, Sheikh? I see you shaking your head. Oh, okay. Everybody know my name. Everybody in the city knows his name. You give a whole lecture about me. 45th of all, who's the man? What do they believe? Of? They believe what you believe? No. But nobody, nobody knows the man's name. But everybody knows our name. What do we call him to again? Okay. So I thought it's a game, and this is this is what happens when people take knowledge and they play with the dean. This is labor. This is playing with the religion. No. Any other questions? Questions, sir. I have a question. Well, it's not relative to the topic. No, no problem. Inshallah, I'm a scorer. Uh, my wife asked me, is she supposed to cut her nails uh, or her hair? So I said, I'm going to ask. Does she plan on slaughtering or you plan on slaughtering? I plan on slaughtering. Right, so if you're going to slaughter, then you shouldn't cut your nails or your hair if you plan on slaughtering. The way it works is, so since today is the first of the Hijjah, you got the first of the Hijjah all the way up until the time for slaughter. You shouldn't shave your hair or cut your nails or take anything away from your skin. If by chance you do cut your hair, you do trim your nails, etc., it's sinful, but there's no kafara, meaning there's no penalty that you will have to pay. You will just be sinful for doing it. Now, let's say, for example, you do not want to slaughter as of today, so you cut your hair. You keep cutting your hair, you keep cutting your nails. And then on the ninth of the Hijjah, on the day of the ninth of Arafah, you say, Dad, I want to slaughter when they eat. So from that point, you stop, you don't cut your hair, you don't shave your nails, etc. And then you can slaughter on that day. And there will be no sin upon you as long as you did not intend to slaughter before that. Does that make sense? No. Is that clear, Yafar? Like, just to make sure I make sure, just to make sure I understand. I, I have intentions on don't cut or shave up until that point. Yes. Don't cut and shave until after you slaughter. Until after you slaughter. As long as you have an intention to slaughter. And right? It's only, and it's only on the head of the household, not everybody in the household. On the one who is slaughtered. As for what I know, the one knows best, but as for the one who is slaughtering, the one who is making the slaughter. Right? right? And this is be something that everyone should be encouraged to do, especially during uh, these first 10 days of the Hijjah. Uh, any other questions about that? Right. We're going to start with that, inshallah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.